Stop it, Sanjay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Directing. <laughs> But we all say yes. <laughs> I'm not unreasonable. No, no. Quite on the contrary. <laughs> okay, we are going live. Okay. All right. What is this? Meeting is streaming live on Facebook. So Sabine and I can be on the screen together, Sanjay? All three will be together for the first second till I change it to speaker mode. Huh? Aye, aye, sir. Let me also see what's happening on Facebook. Just a minute, we'll come on. Are we there? You tell us. Of the many friends watching on Facebook, if you just WhatsApp me and say we are there, means we are there. There are we. Oh, here. We should be here. Just a second. Yeah, we are live, guys. Okay. We are on Facebook. Okay, yes, we can see you guys. Sri Kumar has written. Thank you very much. So, Sanjay? Yeah. Sanjay, this, this is the second in your series of Mentoring Heritage Conservators Initiative. Thank you very much for this, um, this effort that you've taken and for getting us all together. Um, welcome to all the friends who have joined us on Facebook just now. And thank you, Sabine Kut, for being with us. Uh, it's uh, post-dinner. It's even tied in uh, Australia. That's where you are at the moment, right? Uh, so friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, Sabine uh, Kut is, um, is a practicing conservator. She worked for many years in France. And I think she has relocated to Australia at the moment. Is that right, Sabine? Yes, I've been here for 20 yeah. years now. For 20 years now. And uh, Sabine has been working a lot with, uh, you have seen a profile on the Facebook announcement and uh, she has been awarded for the uh, consistent work that she has been doing over the years, uh, especially in the Himalayan region also. And today a uh, topic that uh, Sabine brings to the fore is uh, she's talking about um, uh, uh, Mirka Moha. And uh, this was an artist who passed away unfortunately two years back. Uh, but fortunately, in that uh, period of time that she graced the earth with, uh, she created a lot of works, both in the public domain as well as for private collections. And as art conservators, as people involved with the arts, as historians, as collectors, uh, we see that um, if you divide the world of art objects, you can divide them into 12, 10 to 12 or 12 to 15 categories, starting from the very ancient terracottas, we move on to stone, uh, metals, uh, stone and stucco come together historically also in terms of um, time periods, then metals and you have horn, bone, ivory, you have paintings on paper, on cloth, you have textiles, uh, we have metals, polychrome wood, and 
paintings on cloth, uh, when they took on the um, uh, legacy of the Occident, you have the canvas paintings, paintings on canvas, oils on canvas, and, uh, and as well as on other supports like metal and copper. Uh, then you have the polychrome wood sculptures. And then the category that comes is today's world, uh, contemporary art. Today's talk is going to focus more on uh, contemporary art. So again, when we look at contemporary art, we can actually uh, walk across and take into our purview this entire range of materials, this entire range of support, this entire range of media, uh, the entire range of binders that go with it, the entire range of pigments and possibly dyes. And not only that, that these objects are made specifically with a certain set of materials, but today uh, it is the artists, the artists, the students are encouraged to uh, also be, there is always discipline in art, there has to be, but today there seems to be a tendency also of being as wild as possible with the imagination, as wild and courageous as possible with the way you want to use your materials or handle your materials. So the same artist in the same period of time, literally also in the same period of time or a phase of time in the artist's work, may be using a variety of materials. When these art objects are now in the public domain, because they're also transactional, they have always been, you know, they have always been patrons and they have been artists and everybody makes a living out of the process of, of, of creation of art. Uh, uh, and everyone gets richer, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of the spiritual growth of a person, richer in terms of the joy that you get out of seeing an artwork. And when you're talking about joys of seeing a contemporary artwork, there are as many interpretations, as many as the eyes that look at these artworks. There comes a time, like everything else in life, everything in life, there's a mortality to it. And we are not far removed from that. And, uh, and you find that these works of art, when they are transacted, when they belong to a certain collection, an institution or an individual, with time, they may degrade. And when that happens, there is a wish to perpetuate the life of the object. It could be at a very personal level. It can be at home without consulting anybody. It can be just by taking care of things like we take care of things at home. Or it can also be taking care of things in consultation with somebody who is trained to, is trained in collection care or someone who is trained in art conservation. Right, And art conservators and others themselves consult art historians. They consult collectors who have a discerning eye and who have known the artist maybe intimately or through the books that learned people have uh, indicted, have written. What we find is there comes a time when sometimes all the actors, many of the actors and the stakeholders in this process are at a loss because we do not know what these works comprise of. Or we may know what the works comprise of in terms of the materiality, but we do not know the sequence or the combination with which these were created. So that is a challenge that we face. At the same time, it may happen that Sometimes the artist may, may, sometimes may not. But in case the artist also visualizes, or even if the artist does not visualize, what would the object look like after so many years? What would the passage of time have on the color of the object? For example, if you go to Newcastle on Tin, you have the Baltic flour mills. Just as an example, it just came into my head. Now the Baltic flour mills, the architects, the people who created the Baltic flour mills, which incidentally are a very a major art gallery at the moment. The whole facade has rusted. It has taken on a nice reddish hue, right? 
which takes on the sunset hues of the skies. Now, that was a visualization that the artist or the architect had when they created the artwork. And, they, and in case they have noted it down or they haven't noted it down, they might have passed it down in conversation to somebody. That would help someone who's taking care of that artwork to take an informed decision of what do we do with that supposedly not degradation, but the alteration of the facade of the object, the alteration of the surface aspect of the object with time. And for this, it becomes truly important that we document an artist's work. And documentation can always be richer once there is a personal interaction. And that interaction is not take an appointment and go and talk and go away with it. I think it involves, it, it, it is an engagement with that individual because answers may come over many repeated interactions. And sometimes the same answer is enriched or developed upon by the same artist uh, over time. So for this, it is important that there have been efforts in India also where contemporary works have been discussed by the artists and then the processes and the materials have been noted. But I think there is need across the country in India, as well as across the world, uh, that we do something substantial in terms of um, recording, not just the materiality of the objects and not just the processes of the objects, but also possible intentions and possible visualizations of the artist and what the artist intended. And to give an example of this, we have with us Sabine Kot, and she will talk about how she, um, she engaged with Mir Kamuha and uh, took into her fold of understanding uh, the entire process by which her works were created. So now tomorrow, when something needs to be done, even in terms of art history, even in terms of display and exhibitions and interpretation and public outreach and dissemination, I think we will be in a much more richer position to take informed decisions because of the work that Sabine has done with this artist. And we hope that this presentation by Sabine will give thoughts and ideas to us, uh, as they say, you know, timely questions, timely answers breed just as timely rain ripens other seeds. So Sabine, if you can take us through the process by which you documented this contemporary artist's works, I'm sure we will have lots of thoughts which will come into our mind and inspire some of us to take on these as interesting studies across this subcontinent and beyond its shores into this wide world. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Thank you Sanjay. And it's over to Sabine now. Thank you. Thank you, Anupan, for this wonderful introduction. So now I try to share my screen. Ah. Sanjay, you have to allow me to share the screen. Yeah, I'm still on the screen. Sanjay? It's good to see you guys on the you screen. You have by to the allow screen. me to share the screen. Yes, Sabine, you're on the screen now. Yeah, but I want to share my screen. I'm viewing Sanjay's screen, but he needs to authorize me to share my screen. And I get something which says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Sanjay, can you fix that? Sorry about this. No, it's work. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, but can it's you, not on can Facebook. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we take you into the story of making out with Mia Camera. So I start with a question, and that question is: Do two materials tell a story? And I think yes, but they don't tell a story on their own. I mean, if you do scientific analysis of materials, which is very valuable as well, and you will you will get what the material is, and um, that's very important. But what you won't get is the purpose of that material, why it was used, and uh, what was the intent, what it was supposed to look like. And this type of information is really important as well for the conservation of an artwork and for the appreciation of an artwork. And this type of information, you can only get that from the artist. So I wanted to tell that story with Mia Camora because I had the chance to work with her during four years at the end of her life. So who was she? She was a key figure of Melbourne artistic and social history. She had the restaurants with her husband and she was an artist in her own right. She immigrated from France in 1951 in Australia. And she's present in uh, many, many uh, public and private collections in Australia. She's very well known and she had a lot of uh, public art in Melbourne. So you can see here, she's very well represented in newspaper, in uh, TV, in uh, posters and everywhere. So her artistic production, she's an interesting artist because she, she touched so many techniques. So she did oil painting, she did mosaic, she did drawing, and she did also a lot of textile work that you can see here, some embroideries, which are mixed with painting and uh, some parts are raised, sometimes are not. Tapestry, another embroidery here, and some soft sculpture, which are made of fabric and stuffed and then painted. She did that mainly in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, she also taught that in workshop for adults. And all that uh, met a mixed critical reception. Uh, first, because the materials were not really uh, deemed to be really fine art. They were more women work and uh, sort of things that uh, craft and hobby. And uh, she was a woman as well. so. People didn't take her very, very seriously, but the public really loved her and all the people who attended the workshop loved them. And she was one of the first artists to advertise her technique. And here you can see her in a paper in the 70s, just explaining how she made the dolls and uh, that she was taking bed sheets and everything. Here she is teaching during one of her workshops, teaching someone to do a simplified version of her technique. She worked a lot with community here. You can see her painting with the community, a big mural, which is hung on the side of a train. She did that one as well in the public with the kids in Adelaide. So that was someone really much in the moment, which was uh, the art movement, the community art movement in the 70s and 80s in Australia. And add to that the artist image, look at the way she, she dresses like the Victorian girl. And Victoria, again, it's not really a, a period where the women were particularly uh, celebrated, but she wears the style because she likes it, even if it's not particularly practical. And she plans it. Here's a page of a diary when she plans her outfit. And that had a lot of success as well. You can see her in the newspaper being celebrated because she looks eccentric with this frilly skirt. So all that, Mirka, which is interesting, with that is uh, with the exact materials that were normally meant to be taught to girls to stay at home, you learn embroidery and basically you shut up and you'll be a good wife. And she used that exactly to the opposite. She used that to make a reputation and she used that to really do something different from what was expected of a woman in these, uh, in these years. So it really gives a feminist dimension to her uh, art. So how did I do this research? I had four years to do that because that was the topic of my PhD. So I had a bit of time. You won't always have all that much time, but uh, it, it was really good. So I considered her as a living archive and I used all I could. So that means uh, conservation documentation, of course, if, I, if anything else from her had been conserved, I had a look at that. I interviewed her extensively many times. Uh, 
I looked at her archives, her diaries, her autobiography. I went into a studio. I looked at artwork at various stages of completion. She allowed me to look at her while she was working. We looked at some artwork together. And I did also some reconstruction of um, some of her work to understand the way, uh, the way it was made. So that's, this sort of research is very interesting. You have to be careful of uh, your bias. You become too emotively attached to an artist. So you have to be always keep the distance, not identify yourself too much. So the archive, of course, as you've seen before, there was a lot, there was no lack of it. Uh, newspaper clippings, everything. So I went through all that, but they all say what the journalist wants to know, and, but they don't say usually what the conservator needs to know, but it's important to know them. Artist diary were great because here you see Mirka looking at her diary with me because you could see a lot of things in it and you could collate the memory and the diaries because sometimes she didn't remember exactly the thing, but the diary is contemporary of the moment it was created. So you have something which is probably exact in the diary. Of course, it's a, it's a big task to look at the diary because you have to be discreet. You have to make sure what's important and what's relevant for your research and leave the private stuff alone because everything is mixed in the diary. And there are, of course, issues of privacy if you decide to publish the diary, as I'm doing here, I'm not publishing it, but I show you some places and I've cut all the private stuff. But you can see here, for example, how carefully she plans her thing. Here's the big mosaic, which is uh, the best public art work in Flinders Street in the, the, in the main station in Melbourne, which is her best known artwork. You can see how she plans the frieze and you can find that on the artwork, how she plans the other frieze, how you can find it, and even the cuts of the mosaic tiles, which you can identify as well on the mosaic. So that's all the sort of things you can find in diaries. But the main thing is the artist interview, who is uh, myself and Mirka, and I was restoring with her one of the mosaics. So what do you do with an artist interview? You document the materials and the mode of making, and you put this materiality into context. So what was the period like when she created that? What was the historic context, the social context, and the artistic context? Does it fit into a movement? Did it, uh, did it go at the time when uh, I was talking about, to you about feminism? She created that at a time where a woman artist uh, wasn't a famous woman artist. That wasn't really uh, something very common. I mean, of course, today it's not the case, but at the time, being famous, particularly when you do textile work, was something quite unique. So that lets you to understand the significance of the working process, not only what it is made of, but why it is made this way and what does she mean with that. So I decided to concentrate on the soft sculpture because uh, that was a part of her work that had never been studied and it was uh, starting to get damaged. So of course I had oral history. That was the first hand information from the artist I had a lot of work that I could look at in her studio, in the archives. Here you see Mirka, how she painted them. It's quite good, this photo, because you can see she's drawing them on the fabric, then she stuffs them, and then she paints them. And you can see the sheer extent of how much she produced at the time. And you can see one of these sculpture, another one here. So what are they, these soft sculpture? So they're fabric stuffed. So they're various techniques, but mainly two techniques. Some of them are oil painted like these two, and they're all double-sided. So the oil painted one are made on a render, so they're semi-rigid and they're painted with stand oil and varnish. And sometimes they are freestanding like this one. This one is an oil painted one, but it's not freestanding. And sometimes they are matte and they're made with casein paint and they don't have a render, so they're very soft and they're not freestanding. So what are they? After all, I told you about Mirka. They're, of course, for conservators, they're fragile objects. They're at risk of loss because they haven't aged very well because they don't withstand very well the manipulation. And she stuffed them with some synthetic foam, which didn't age very well. And the, the aging is, um, of that foam is it's crumbling and it loses volume. So the paint layer on top just crumbles as well and cracks. 
But with all I told you about Mirka, these soft sculptures are much more than that. They're also documents of all this, the practice of artist run workshops, which don't do, you don't see very much anymore, of Mirka's curiosity and dexterity, of the rise of feminine techniques in the art, and of the fact that fine arts were democratizing in the 70s and the artists started to create art, which wasn't reserved for the elite, but they wanted it to be for the whole community. So how do you conserve all these meanings? Uh, I don't pretend to bring solutions, definitive solutions, but I can offer you three case studies and there are three different decisions which Mirka all approved. And I've tried to consider for all of them significance and access to the sculpture. So the first one, I called it the lady with horns for obvious reason, that uh, small soft sculpture, it's about um, 30 centimeters high. And I was discussing with her in her studio what she wanted to do to conserve her, her art, her legacy. And she just picked that from a shelf and she said, why don't you try with that one? And uh, you do what you want and uh, you show me afterwards. So you can see that it was really crumbling. It was, the horns were sort of falling like that. It was folded here. And you see a close up, it was losing paint crumbling every time the horn were falling, were moving, some more flakes of paint will fall. The base was in good condition because it was stuffed with plaster. So it's plaster up to here and then it's foam. So I tried to look at the significance and because I told you before everything that I knew about Mirka, so what was the significance of this particular doll? So it was coming from the artist personal collection. It changed ownership because she gave it to me. So most likely would get more access and it would be mentioned in publication and I'm mentioning it today. Uh, it had a lot of associated social meanings. She was something that, um, that was something she made for her workshops. She said, I had always to find new ideas to make my students interested. So this one with half plaster, half stuffed was something she experimented. Uh, luckily for me, there was limited stakeholders for this, um, for this conservation because conservation is a lot about decision making and the more people are involved, the more decision making is difficult. But this time we were only the artist and the conservator, so that was easier. So the point of significance our privilege was the time she made it for the reasons I've told you, because she experimented with the stuffing and there was a teaching period. She taught for 25 years adults workshop. And the time of conservation, because we were lucky enough to do that during a research, so I could do something which was quite documented and I had time. So the decision was a quite interventive treatment, which I will show you quickly. So first I made a replica because I wanted to understand how it was made. It was not really clear for me, so I can, you can see all the stages of the replica. You can see that I'm not really talented, so mine was really crooked and that made her laugh, but it doesn't really matter. I didn't replicate the horns because I'm quite lazy and it wasn't the point and it was too difficult. And then I could create the damage. So I just slashed a little bit the neck, <coughs> pardon me. And then I emptied a little bit of uh, the stuffing so it was falling as well. And then I experimented my treatment which uh, was to restuff it very little through the, through the damage and then to close, to close the, the slit and then to put a little bit of filling and to retouch it. So it took a bit of trial and error, and that's why I made a replica. And uh, when I was satisfied, I took it on the real doll. So you can see here, I just cut a little slit in each horn and I could fill them like this as well. I went through the damage here. So I didn't cut through the paint, I cut through the, through the loss of paint and I stuffed it very little by little with the new synthetic wool, which conserves better, with a toothpick actually. So it took ages to do that. And then I re the edges, put some render and retouch it with watercolor and did a very little cleaning on the painting, on the, yeah, on the painted surface. And here you can see the doll restored and you can see that it can proudly stand up now and extend its horns, which was, the ID. And here you see Mirka, very happy with the doll. She couldn't believe that it could be 
restored like that and it could still use, uh, still looked used and uh, homely, but uh, that it could stand. So what did I do for that? I was, uh, I was lucky enough to have the time to do that again, but I mean, that was a conservation treatment that addressed the degradation of the materials, but also wanted to retain the social role of the doll. And for me, the social role was all that. That was a companion to be handled, a moment of technical experimentation. That was evidence of the community art culture in Australia in the 70s and 80s, which doesn't really exist anymore. It was an evidence of uh, her exploration of the theme, uh, creators with horns, you can find that in a lot of uh, other, in all over, around the earth, in painting, in sculpture, but in embroidery, in drawings as well. And of course, there was a good example of an artist sanctioned conservation treatment because this doll can be now handled with care so that when used the possibility of access, it can, be, it can be loaned, it can be displayed, it can be discussed as a case study, which I'm doing right now. And most importantly, demonstrate the value of conservation to the artist first and her gallery and to the collectors and to the public. And that was quite important. Of course, you will say that, uh, well, what about if it's more damaged? And uh, what's a question which is always good to ask to an artist is what's the extent of damage they consider acceptable? And when should you do something? So I had another case study, which was this doll as well. That was quite a large doll. It's probably 50 or 60 centimeters long. And it was very, very damaged. Uh, I have a few close up here and you can see this is a little bit of paint left and otherwise it's just the paint has fallen it's just the ghost of the paint and the and the initial drawing so you can see a trace of the color but you don't have the paint anymore and what was interesting was that it was almost the exact translation of uh, one of these drawings made by Mirka to illustrate a French poem so Again, looked at the significance. So Mirka is here manipulating the doll and you can see that it, it doesn't hold at all. It's really in bad condition. As it was, it was still a good example of her technique. You can see how it's made. It was an example of the fluidity between techniques, how she could go from uh, drawing to sculpture, from 2D to 3D almost effortlessly. It was also an example of degradation due to the display conditions. So Mirka's solution was, uh, oh, it should be repainted. So I just said, well, okay, can you do it? Do you think you will do it? And she said, oh, no, no, not really, because I'm not doing that. I haven't done in dolls for 25 years. No, I'm beyond that. I don't want to do it. So I said, oh, so what can we do? He said, oh, you can do it. I trust you. So then I started to say, no, but I'm not comfortable doing that because I mean, it's not exactly repainting to that extent. It's not exactly what I consider my role as a conservator. So that didn't trouble her at all. But what, what did trouble her was when I asked her, but if I did repaint it, would you still be the author? Or do you think it will be me? So that got her thinking for a while. And then after thinking hard, she realized that uh, no, that would be unacceptable. She wouldn't be the author anymore and she wasn't ready for that. So we decided together that to that extent of damage, that wasn't acceptable for her, but uh, repenting it wasn't acceptable as well. So the, the only decision that could be made was no treatment, documentation of the work, of course, and of our process of deciding that. And quite importantly, that could be used as well as a case for promoting preventive conservation to look at say what's happening when the display conditions are not good. And of course, that got me thinking because I just thought, what about, I mean, that's something that can happen to a lot of us of sculpture just because the materials are so fragile and they don't really stand very well 40 years of age, so let alone in uh, 20 more years. So what about if we could do something to prevent that? So this is my third case study, it's prevention solutions. So you can see the problem with this soft sculpture is their fragility and their condition which prevents their display. So museums have them or they can borrow them from private collectors, but they, it's difficult to display them because a lot of them are in this sort of condition. And if you don't 
display them standing, but you lay them flat on something, you just then privilege one face over the other, and that's not really what the artist wanted. And every time you're handling them, you cause damage. But people want to see them because people love them. And if you can't access them, they will disappear from the collective memory and uh, she will be remembered for other things, but not for that. And that wouldn't be right because that's really how she created a reputation. So my brief was to enable safe handling, safe display, safe storage. And uh, I brainstormed a little bit um, with a friend of mine who is a very talented uh, frame conservators and does a lot of uh, basis for sculpture as well. And we found out that the solution would be to, what about if you had something to support the sculpture and uh, enable it display, but once the sculpture will be on that, it will never go off. So that same display stand will turn into a storage stand if you dismounted part of it. And so which is, we decided to experiment that and we did that on my replica. So I made more replicas. Here you can see one, another of these soft sculpture which just can't be displayed because it's too, it's, uh, too soft and too crumbling. So I did replicas intentionally with the, the problems that could be seen on the soft sculpture. So you can see there is a, a flapping, flapping wings, a flapping leg, it's uh, damaged here. And this is what we made. So we did the transparent acrylic. We, dis we cut transparent acrylic to the shape of the sculpture. It's just tiny, tiny, a uh, little bit smaller, but half a millimeter smaller. It's attached to it with silicone tubing, conservation silicone tu tubing, which is transparent. Here you see the other face of the sculpture. Here you can see the, the plexiglass, the acrylic stand. And on the back, there is this thing, a little sleeve, which is molded just in order to receive a little rod, which here is transparent, but the rod could be made on any color you want. And that's what can go into a base here. And you can dismount the rod and the base, and you can put that, as you see here, everything goes in storage, but the sculpture is still attached on its, um, on its acrylic sheet. And if someone wants to see it, then they will manipulate the support, the acrylic support, and not the soft sculpture anymore. You have another example here of one the oil painted soft sculpture. And we made a stand so you can see one face and with a mirror, of course, you can see the other face, but if you place it in the middle of the room, you can turn around. But, uh, and this is a detail of the back. And this is Mirka, we, we did a lot of them. So this is Mirka very happy as well with all the preventive, uh, all the storage stands and, and display stands for uh, not her sculpture, but uh, the sculpture I made. And uh, that was a proposition that she liked very much. So in conclusion, I mean, I showed you that to show you how interesting it is first to work with artists and uh, how good it is. I was lucky because that was the end of her life. So she had a holistic vision of her career and she could already see the, the effect of time on her work. So she could tell me really what she considered acceptable, what she considered not acceptable and at what time you had to intervene because she considered that this was not anymore what she wanted. So documenting contemporary practice is very important and has a lot of benefit for conservation. And uh, one of these benefits is collaborating with the artist, introduce really a lot of respect and reciprocity. You're working with them, not against them. And uh, very often conservators are seen as people who are really annoying because they tell you don't do this, don't do that. So this is another way of approaching it. And once you understand all that, you can transmit this significance on many levels. And that will facilitate, of course, decision making. But most importantly, that will inform historical, artistic, and social research, which is, in my view, what conservation is all about, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabine. I'm just unmuting Anupam. Uh, can I stop? Do, what do I do? I stop sharing the screen? No, no, no. 
uh, yeah, you can stop sharing the screen. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was good. Anupam. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sabine. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions from amongst the people who are also seeing it live on Facebook. And Sanjay, you yourself must have questions. And I suppose if the uh, if the ladies and gentlemen who are watching it on Facebook, uh, they will be sending the questions. And I suppose Sanjay, you're looking at those questions from them. Are you looking at their responses? Uh, I'm looking at uh, the. It's on the Facebook feed. There are too many questions, but I can start with some questions of my own. Would you like to begin with? Okay. Oh yes. Oh yes. I've got a lot of questions. Okay, so I'll go um, later. First, you begin. But Sabine, uh, Sabine, the one thing that I was interested in is uh, you did some reconstructions of the artist's work, and I noted that uh, while you were uh, when you did the doll, you had different colors. You didn't copy the colors. Was there a reason for that? And uh, can you explain the process of uh, reconstruction, not in terms of uh, not in terms of technique, but in terms of your thought process? Um, well, when I did the reconstruction, that was for two reasons. Because first, she had told me how she made them. But uh, you know, it's a bit like cooking sometimes. Uh, there are things you understand only when you make them. And yeah. it's not a practice which is uh, very rare. Like sometimes, uh, it's good to do that, not only to understand how it's made, but also to experiment treatment on that. For example, they did, um, the team at the Tate Gallery did that a few years ago on a Rothko painting that had been vandalized. And they experimented the treatment on a replica first. And then when they were happy, they did that. Um, I did it a bit differently because um, I didn't want um, the, the, my dolls to be confused later on so, with Mirka's dolls. But I wanted to make them close enough so she could identify with them and she could help me. So anyway, they're all marked with a permanent marker, Sabine sample, so they're not Mirka. And it was really interesting because that looks very simple, but uh, doing them made me realize the extent of work, what's behind the scene. I mean, it's a lot of work. And uh, as well, how organized she must have been to produce such a quantity. She would have had a sort of a factory chain, some, but she was the only one doing it. And she told me all the time it was huge work, but I never realized before actually making one and how difficult it was and how talented she was because uh, I show you the reconstruction at the end, but I had many, many, many trials before and the, the first one were not at all nice. <laughs> it would be interesting to actually see the trial also because then one would get an end uh, sort of <laughs> of how difficult uh, all this can get. Um, when you tried out the treatment on that, uh, did you feel uh, when you finally did the original, there was some, uh, you know, what was the difference between doing it on the doll and... Mm. Well, I couldn't, yeah, mine was recent, so I couldn't really crack it. And uh, <laughs> I tried hard. <laughs> But it didn't crack really that much. And then that's how I realized she told me that then, because she never told me before, that, oh, yeah, yeah, put a little bit of plaster in the render. I said, ah, oh, now you tell me, yeah. <laughs> so I had to make another one. But with a fresh plaster, you can't really crack it the way. I mean, I, I could a little bit, but not as much. But that was enough to make me... Uh, appreciate if that treatment, that sort of treatment was possible or not. And there was a lot of things that I had planned that I couldn't do. For example, I thought I would re-stitch it, the cut. Uh, it didn't work very well, so I didn't stitch it. I just uh, adhered it. And that one was particularly difficult because normally a lot of the other dolls, you can just unstitch on the side because they're closed on the side. So you can just unstitch a little bit, fill it and re-stitch. But that one didn't have an opening because it had been stuffed from the base and then the base was filled with plaster. So there was no opening, so I couldn't really open. But luckily it was damaged in some way. So through the damage, I could find an entrance. And um, all her work obviously has 
every doll would have some variations of the technique. Yes, I, yeah, I would yeah. assume. Uh, yes. So, uh, so uh, uh, you basically were able to list out one, two, three, four uh, combinations that you were using, or was there an is there a limit to how many combinations she had, or was it completely like? I didn't really, no, I couldn't really systematize. I mean, there are main directions. So they're usually like that, but uh, the oil painted dolls, they're usually like that, but then some of them would be a bit different and uh, the fabric will be different, but uh, you can't list uh, doll by doll. So you have to take the main characteristics here. Yeah. Anupam? Yeah, uh, Sanjay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nivedita Dhage, who is a conservator at the CSMBS Museum Art Conservation Center, uh, her question to Sabine is that in your career, Sabine, and in your interaction with artists, how many of them were comfortable with the idea of retouching their work or recreating some of the pieces that might be missing? How far is too far? Um, well, that's a, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, some artists, Amirka was one of them, she'd never heard about conservation before. So first she wasn't happy at all that someone will do something. So I had to go and visit her and talk and, uh, you know, talk about something else and basically gain her trust. And then she realized that uh, even if she wasn't touching the thing, I would listen to what she said. And I think this is the key. You have to show people. And some other artists, uh, I remember in France, some artists telling me, you do exactly what you want. When an artwork leaves my studio, it lives its own life. It's not me, I don't, I don't care, uh, it's, it's its life. I don't want to be involved anymore. And some other artists would control every single step. And uh, I did sometimes, I did want something with uh, Daniel Buren, the, the artist who does these vertical striped um, paintings and I had to stretch them on canvas and he sent me like uh, at that time there were faxes not emails and that was like 10 pages of fax with instruction with a, it had to be exactly the way I wanted and I had to send photographs and it was a uh, micromanage to the little details so I think I can't really give a straight answer to that question. It really varies, human natures vary. So conservators need to be very flexible, but most of it to be respectful. Uh, I, just, uh, I just want, uh, which basically means that uh, it's very important uh, in contemporary art conservation that uh, conservators document, talk to the artists, you know, as much as possible and get uh, as much feedback and information together uh, mm. so that uh, you know understand the techniques yeah. because yeah, it's, quite it's not only yeah not only documenting the artist's technique and his intention but uh, something yeah. I didn't say but uh, for a lot of artists their intent uh, changes with they don't consider the artwork the same way when they're young and while well, they just finished it and at the end of their career what what was their main thing becomes mainly a, a milestone sometimes. But also you have to document the decision-making process, why you took that decision. And that's also because we're part of our period. Maybe in 10 years time or 50 years time, people will look at that and think, how could they take such decision? But they understand that because the historic context will be what it is at the moment. I remember one example uh, of Manzoni who had these white canvases and uh, he basically didn't want, he wanted them to be, whenever they were shown, they should be absolutely white. So he had uh, sort of said, go ahead and paint them white before you show them. But once they went into collection, nobody, no collector was willing to uh, cover them even when the artist was alive there was a huge problem with the galleries and the artists because uh, the owners didn't want them uh, painted over so they wanted those uh, so that brings in another aspect of contemporary yeah. collectors yeah. to yeah. the artist and the conservator 
that's what I was talking about with stakeholders yeah. and uh, an artist is one voice to listen to, but it's not the only one. So yeah. if uh, a painting or if an artwork belongs to a museum, then the museum might decide other things or it, maybe the, what the artist wants can't fit really into the museum's policy, so they have to find agreements. They have to find ways to make everyone happy. But the artist, not everybody, the artist is not always right, yeah. but it's it's not always wrong either. I mean, it's just a, a conversation that needs to be had here. Yeah. We can't beat our babies. Mm. Mm? Uh, Sanjay? We can't beat our babies. Mm. We can't stamp our babies. Uh, Anupam, you. Um, Sabine, uh, there's a young uh, conservator, uh, Anjali Jain. And uh, other than commending you for the insightful presentation, uh, this you. has uh, some context with, you know, remember, uh, uh, I should be asking you whether you remember, but you had talked about the conventional and participatory methods of documentation at the beginning of your talk, right? Mm -hmm. In the red and the green. So in this context, Anjali says that, uh, uh, do you always try to collect the primary sources like uh, diaries, newspaper articles, uh, so as actually they would be secondary sources. So do you yeah. always try to collect these secondary sources like diaries, newspaper articles, and then how do you, do you scan them and keep them or do you keep them as the real uh, physical form? Well, the diaries, um, I was really lucky because uh, not every artist first has diaries and uh, not every artist wants to show their diaries, but um, she offered that. And so I was very happy, but uh, I haven't kept them, of course. No, I just looked at, looked at them in her place and with her. And uh, she was commenting everything and reliving her story. And uh, she also asked me to take photos of the pages I was interested in. And she trusted me to, whenever this was shown and published, to cut the frame to only technical things. Uh, so if you can, it's great. If you can't, well that's what it is but uh, I tend to try to yeah, do a bit of research on every artist first. First it's a courtesy for the artist if you do your homework before you don't ask them questions that they haven't said already seven times uh, to various journalists and um, it's respectful as well for them because if you know their work you already prepare some questions about it and the what you do with it is uh, really, I mean, now we're fortunate we can scan everything. So you can compile uh, your documentation. Usually what's, uh, if you want to transmit things to conservators, it's another thing, uh, it's another topic, which I didn't uh, touch here, but uh, if you want to transmit things, the raw data is not really, nobody will have the same time as you. So it's good to do a sort of a, a transcript or a, a summary of what you've been doing and uh, with the sources in reference with photos and with the decision making. And this is what will interest other conservators that will save them time. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Actually, Anjali, you were right. Uh, the diary would be a primary source, of course. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and Sabine, you've been, you're, there are lots of compliments coming, so I'm not uh, listing them out. But there's one that has come along with an uh, interesting remark uh, and a question. This is by Parul Pandya, uh, who is an art historian as well as an accomplished classical Indian dancer. Um, she says that, um, it's very relevant. She says that, fine, there has been this... Uh, this documentation, this micro documentation of one living artist has been done. Okay. Now, on the basis of this, she says, how far is it possible to extrapolate a more broadly applicable conservation method from this documentation? Is it possible to extrapolate it into other areas and things or other artists? What is your advice? Well, I would. Um... If I had to look at some other stuffed um, stuffed paintings or, or soft sculpture, I mean, you can call them both ways. I would probably remember what I did there, but uh, 
if you can talk to the artist, I would ask them, and uh, there might be a completely different take on that, of course. I've been, um, before this talk, I was looking a little bit in, uh, at contemporary Indian artists, and I found some uh, very interesting artists. I do think uh, some of them will be really interesting to talk to, and to talk to regularly, because you talk to them when they're 40, and then you talk to them again when they're 60, and then again when they're 80, and uh, you see how they evolve and how they see, and they start to think about their legacy, which they don't necessarily think about when they're young. But people like uh, Sheila Gauda, I'm not too sure how to pronounce her name, but she's using a lot of craft techniques and uh, the sculpture with ropes and human hair. And it has a lot of significance that takes back to tradition and crafts so, and women conditions. So that will be people who would, who would be really interesting to talk to. One, one very uh, related point here. Uh, would you, Sabine or even Sanjay, would you advise uh, an artist who is practicing at the moment, who's a practicing artist, would you advise that person to say and say that, you know, these materials that you're using, if you use this other material, it would be more long lasting or this material is going to degrade faster. Would you proffer such a suggestion or would you do it when you're more comfortable with them? What would be your take on such a thing? Would you be actually interfering in the artist um, process by saying something like this? It's as difficult a well to understand. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult to answer. Uh, first, I would never, well, you, if you want to say that, you need to be pretty sure of your point, first point, yeah. And secondly, I wouldn't say anything like that if I wasn't asked to. If an artist is asking advice and say, what do you think about that? And I think of a particular artist here in Australia who worked with um, wax and oil and uh, he, he consulted with a conservator, not me, and uh, they worked together for a while and he asked him because he, he had noticed that there were problems, there were delamination. And he said, can you advise me on the conservation and what can I do to do something better with that? And they worked out that it was due to a particular component of, uh, I can't remember now, but of the oil paint. So it changed that particular oil paint. But that has to come from the artist. I think the mission of the conservator is not to stop an artist to create. It's just to manage the change that happens to an artist of. But some artists are interested in the technique and, uh, and they're interested in their longevity and some aren't. So... Sante, your take on this? I absolutely uh, agree with, uh, it's not our job to tell the artists, even when they are working with very fragile material, it's our job to figure out how to ensure what the artist has done survives. That's our job. It's not our job because if we start advising, then the artist will not come out of the 15th century. They'll be, uh, you know, everyone will push them into the 15th century and say, you do uh, tempera painting and that has survived the maximum time. That's, mm. that's not mm. actually correct. Uh, and you wouldn't have the variety of uh, works that we see today if people had started, uh, you know. Uh, I know that a lot of conservators actually uh, uh, tell artists that you shouldn't be doing this and that. But it's not correct. I don't think it's our job. It's not our business to, uh, unless asked for, as Sabine said. And there also, you uh, you know, you might be interfering in the process, but that interference is at the artist's volition. That is a different thing. Because uh, you can change the course of uh, what is happening uh, through your intervention. So you have to be very, very careful. I and I would ask, uh, I would not add something. I, I, I usually say don't do it. Yeah. And I would add something as well. It's, um, it's I would say something that people maybe won't like, but uh, it's not that terrible if an artwork dies, you know. Sometimes the, some works are made with uh, very fragile things and they're not meant to, da to last very long. There are other ways to remember them. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, techniques of documentation now. And maybe it's not a big deal if the artwork didn't survive. Because I remember 
talking to an artist, a young artist, and you said, but you're conservators. Why do you want to conserve everything? Yeah. And I said, yeah, good point. <laughs> Okay, there's one thing that brings us back to the beginning of Sabine's talk, and that was this aspect about replication of the artwork. We all know that when conservation training is imparted, uh, the trainee is taught in the classical techniques. Now, in this case, we're talking about also trying to understand through physical practice, uh, the creation of an artwork by a contemporary artist. Sorry. I think there was some problem at my, sorry. Can you hear? Yeah, it's all, it's all fine. So um, regarding this replication of an artwork, so a gentleman, the other comments also, Akshay Agarwal has written uh, more expansively. And um, he says that, uh, like a lot of people have commented that they like this idea of making these artworks as to gain insight into the process and the material. But at the same time, they asking whether this was more of your personal interest or do you find it to be a necessary process for documentation of an artist's artwork? Um, I think it was a bit of both, yeah. I mean, uh, realistically, you're not going to do a replica or a reconstitution of an artwork every time you have to do conservation work. Uh, in that particular case, that was a long research that was uh, for a PhD. So I had the time and uh, even uh, the mission to go in depth into things. And I was interested personally, yeah. But sometimes it's a necessity and um, probably making uh, as many reconstruction as I did wasn't super necessary, but uh, some of them were necessary. For example, to do the the display and storage stands that would have been difficult to experiment with real uh, damaged sculptures because that would have damaged them more. Uh, so it's a bit of both, but I, I, Sanjay, won't, uh, I won't deny that there was a lot of personal pleasure. Yeah. Right. Sanjay, how much time do we have? Uh, we can, I think we have uh, some half an hour or so uh, okay. more. Uh, um, what I would actually say is that uh, uh, what Sabine has said is, of course, uh, it is need-based. But uh, here in India, we haven't actually gotten into the idea of uh, tech uh, technical history and uh, technological, uh, trying to figure out things from a technological point of view, trying to work out the methodology of the artist. Uh, it's uh, the technical art history is not taken taken root. So because uh, it's such a um, alien idea, therefore there is some problem with this uh, approach. But definitely, uh, in some cases, it is required. I think that uh, attempts at be made to understand the technology. Attempts be made to understand the layering. Attempts be made to understand how it's done, even if at times the solutions may be very simple and you already know the solution. But uh, if the facility is uh, available and it can be done, it would be, uh, it really needs to be done at some level. Particularly also uh, for, as part of the training of the conservators, because uh, the, the materials are so complex and complicated and uh, let's say in India, we have a range of uh, 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 the people, the young uh, students who are coming in come from a whole lot of backgrounds and contemporary art techniques are not necessarily talked about or taught in our institutions. So that leaves a big gap. For example, if you look at uh, the Rothko painting in the Tate, uh, just the doing of it uh, was a big job and they had to take permission, of course, uh, that whole issue of copyrights and permission, they had to take permission from the Rocco family before they could even start that. That, uh, that angle is missing here. We can, we can more or less pick it up and do whatever we want because that awareness is not there. But A, to bring in that awareness that it, uh, it's a process that has to have approval at different uh, levels, 
and then to do it in a particular way and then to understand so obviously uh, it's not for every place and it's not for individuals if they uh, but it's something that we need to understand and start getting into mm. um sabin uh uh when you made the presentation and you showed the perspex uh, supports for the uh, sculptures yeah. i was just wondering the answer to this could be a simple it depends on a case to case basis but i was wondering as a question is that is it okay for an artist to decide how to display his or her artworks or how much to conserve or the way to conserve and is it okay for an artist to say what you talked about you know the sanctioned conservation that the artist has sanctioned that conservation so yeah, i think yes, this um, has lots of answers but it will be nice to have comments from both of you sabine and sanjay uh, artist sanction that's um, it's been proposed by an american conservator to my knowledge glen walton who uh, talked about that he is a specialist in contemporary art and that came from the realization that uh, we were talking about artist intent you know respect the artist intent but this is not something which is static the artist intent and he realized that and many people realized that when you practice uh, approaching contemporary artists you see that their intent changes for example mirka she made the sculptures she made that not to last but then later on she was happy that they lasted and she told me i'm glad that some people kept them well and uh, i wouldn't say now that not to be careful with them so it varies so when you talk about artist sanction that sort of integrates that uh, dimension of time that means this is what the artist thinks about this artwork at that particular moment no more than that and that doesn't mean doesn't mean it's a religious word it's just what it is at that moment it's it's uh, one of the beginning of your question uh is it okay for an artist to say that well can i answer with another question which is why wouldn't Please. that be okay why wouldn't yeah. that be okay that an artist gives its advice his or her advice okay. and so we are saying that it is eventually event it basically it is yet another opinion which helps a conservator to take an informed yeah. decision yeah. sanjay yes. your call on this actually um, it's a, it's a very very important thing uh, in our context if i may contextualize it in an indian context because uh, if you know that we tend to take away the original frames like nobody's business and change stretches like uh, you know uh, like it's like nothing there's no second thought about changing stretch stretches and changing uh, frames and uh, galleries particularly uh, you know paintings with thin frames end up with huge massive golden frames uh, what what we know already from the experience of european art uh, impressionist art and later art where a lot of paintings which were um, not necessarily meant to be in those gilded frames the stretches were removed and the frames were put in we already know that that's not right because it does a lot of other things to the painting so uh, we haven't taken from that we are, uh, that's an experience that's already there for 150 years at least but and most conservators easily change frames uh, artist intent is with respect to the frame the gallery curator takes a Uh, usually take the decision uh, only in installations uh, do artists uh, insist on whatever they want to insist but once it goes out of the hand of the artist uh, uh, whatever way the artist wanted it display is usually not uh, respected and we i think we need to have a talk on this subject and it needs to really get down uh, to 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 the level where uh, galleries and art historians and curators understand the ramifications of what is happening and uh, because we lose so much of information we are losing all the time te technological information we are also losing inscriptions and so on and so forth that are 
on that uh, stretcher or whatever. So I think we need to have this conversation uh, at a much broader level. It's not there, at least uh, I know that, uh, you know, I've changed a few stretchers and few frames. <laughs> Me? But it's, uh, yeah. yeah. But, but it's something that really needs to, uh, needs to uh, get down to the educational institutions first and beyond them, to practicing conservators and to Calvins and everyone. There has to be an awareness. I, I don't think there is a, there's generally contemporary art, the way it is dealt with uh, uh, is not absolutely there yet, but uh, this conversation needs to start. That was one of the reasons for inviting mm. you. Okay. But, um, yeah, yeah, basically what you mean and uh, what I was trying to uh, enhance as well, giving that talk is conservation is not applying recipes. It's really think before you do something. And when you think, you just have to inform your reflection with all the sources, all the things you can have. And if you have a very good and structured way of reasoning, you will make an informed decision. And a decision, there is not one decision. A decision is a decision, it's a choice. And by definition, you could have made another choice. So you have to justify your choice, your choice and to document it. But when you take the time to stop and think about what you're doing, you normally benefit from that. Yeah. And everyone benefits, the artist as well and the, the public. It's talking about benefit, um... Uh, Sabine, one phrase, uh, well, it is dusk in India just now, and it is also dusk of, for, for the lecture, you know. It's towards the closing hours of the lecture, closing minutes of the lecture. Uh, one phrase that I'll pick up from your talk was this thing that you mentioned as uh, the social role of the doll in this context, mm. right? And I think uh, everything from the way how some artwork has to be handled or the way the artwork has to be viewed. Uh, I think it has a lot of relevance, not just for contemporary art, but also in terms of art, in terms of historic and artistic objects, the way they are handled. And by calling it the social role, uh, I think this itself becomes a topic um, of um, uh, rumination, something to think yes. about. Yeah, because you could always decide, for example, to present that thing in an archaeological manner. But I was lucky to ask the artist and she said, no, I want them to be still to be standing, to be cuddling and uh, to be able to be companion for people. This is why I made them. And I think I can decide to ignore that. But why would I? I mean, this is what the artist wants. And there are some possibilities to do that. So that really takes in the social context into account. And there are some other things that we see in museums now, we just appreciate them for the aesthetic value, but we don't have much, I mean, this is true for a lot of uh, indigenous art or ritual art or religious art. We've lost their, their significance, their, their context, their social role or their religious role. And sometimes I think it's uh, losing a dimension and the, Maybe it's and the, too bad. The, yeah. the other equal emphasis that you placed on something was the significance of the objects. Mm. You know, while we all know it is important, how often is it that we as conservators or conservation trainees or young students, uh, I think people just go straight to the objective sign of the damage and start hitting that rather than first sitting, going back, watching the work of art for its, uh, its significance. You know, yes. whether it's and visual what, or historic or monetary or whatever. Because it's worth asking yourself the question, um, why do you conserve something? And yes. people ask you in general to conserve something, but we rarely conserve something which, ha which has no value for, for no one. So we conserve something because it has significance for at least a group of people. And it has value for them. And this is this value you have to grasp in order to transmit it or to make sure not to overlook it. Sanjay, you want to, I'll ask you for some words and then Sabina and then I'll round uh, it up. Two things, one, uh, there are quite a few questions. If Sabine, you can take a little time tomorrow or whenever you have a little bit of time and go through the questions on our page, 
and uh, maybe answer a few which uh, if you like tomorrow on the page, yeah. on the okay, page. Yeah. Uh, because that uh, that's what kailash did and it makes a difference uh, okay. uh, and that's part of what we really want some mentorship uh, not to bother you all the time but at least <laughs> okay this, but uh, tomorrow uh, please because tonight uh, probably go to bed yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's so already are, late for me you, you can do them for a few days so uh, one okay question, that's that's up to you but uh, sure. because there are quite a few uh, questions that i don't think we'll be able yeah. to take uh, yeah. care of right now uh, yeah. and, and the, basically that the, but also the fact what she talked about significance we have not started uh, approaching objects from the point of uh, value and significance. Uh, we just jump into what is, uh, as you said, uh, look at the uh, look at the problem and just jump into a solution. Uh, that's something we need to uh, make part of our practice because uh, whether it is, I think architects are doing a bit more of significance and value because of the world heritage experience. But uh, conservation in in, uh, in our parts, uh, I don't think we have yet. Uh, at least the institutions haven't yet started talking about it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, in different places of the world, it's different. But uh, in Australia, for example, there is a big emphasis placed on significance. Uh, for the museums as well and for the conservators to understand why this, uh, what is the significance and where does it reside in the object, in, uh, in, in which sort of value. And uh, that's really interesting. It's uh, the philosophy of conservation, if you want, but uh, that's uh, really what's fundamentally it's interesting. It's a good approach, I think. Yeah. I so, agree that it's unfair. So uh, there's interesting questions by Antara Sharma, by Anjali Jain, by Poonam Varma, uh, Mascarenas. Uh, in fact, uh, because Poonam has been asking this earlier, uh, there have been occasions in our practice where sometimes when you talk to the artist who wants a certain intervention to be done because the person is around, but if you reason out with the artist and make them see the different other aspects of what it takes to make informed decisions, sometimes they come round to you, just like clients do. The artist also does. So it is not that the artist says something and you've got to just go ahead and do it. Because as you mentioned, there are so many stakeholders. It could be even the curators. They might have a different take. Could be the curator of a temporary exhibition for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. So not just the con. I think everybody puts their heads together and their hearts together and their minds together and take, helps to take mm -hmm. informed decisions. So there will be some questions over to you. Um, uh, and uh, maybe just be, just before you go, because it is a little different question, is your take on the reversibility of the materials that you should apply for a contemporary artwork? Ah, that's a good question. Um, of course, you should always try to apply reversible materials. Um, Reversibility, anyway, that's a concept. Uh, when I was a student, I was taught with reversibility. And now it's been changed as well because we realize with time that nothing is completely reversible. If you put an adhesive, you, can't, you can never remove the integrity of the adhesive. So what we try to do now is to make sure that you don't compromise a future treatment. So it's more retreatability than reversibility. So you don't put something be it in contemporary art or an ancient art alike, you try not to put something on the artwork that will block any future treatment. For example, uh, completely include it in wax or you know something that will completely jeopardize the future treatment. In contemporary art, it can be tricky sometimes, but um, as long as you have a, a an ethic, it's good because you try to stick to it. Sometimes you can't, but uh, you always document it. Sometimes in contemporary art, particularly for retouching, because there is very rarely a varnish on top, the only way to get the same aspect is to use the same material. So that's where documentation and the mapping exactly where you've been working is important, rather than doing something and just pretending that nothing happened. 
So you're no, not you're acknowledging that it's not uh, reversible, but uh, yeah. you document where you've been. Mm -hmm. And in this context, just one last one uh, that Anupama um, Anupama Gaur is asking. She says she's asking that how important then is it in this context that the owner's opinion about what needs to be done should be considered. Is it particularly important or again, is it equally to be discussed amongst the various partners? I would say equally to be discussed. I mean, it's difficult as well because uh, the owner, particularly if it's a private owner, they can always decide that if they disagree with what you offer, they won't do it. So that's where your previous uh, person was putting that very well, thinking, I mean, if you discuss, if you explain, if you support your argumentation, people can turn around and understand things as well. And you can maybe turn around as well and uh, you find uh, an agreement somewhere in the middle. I mean, I think uh, it's always possible to find a point of Thank you. agreement. Thank you. Sanjay, your take on this? The owners, how, how weighted is that? It's, it's that uh, take, uh, decision. the moment we approach an object from the significance value stakeholder uh, framework, all these things get taken care of in that framework, more or less. Because you take uh, opinion or you consider every stakeholder and how they value the object and which aspect do you privilege uh, depends on um, on how it is uh, privileged. So uh, the whole thing changes. We are so used to looking at the object and doing what we want uh, or following whosoever brought it to us to you and uh, doing it rather than uh, this framework. Uh, I think uh, we need to shift to this framework. Thank you, Sanjay. And taking two words from what you've said, the privilege and framework you mentioned. So first of all, it's been a real privilege to have you, Sabine, with us. And Thank it you. has been a great privilege to be on this um, uh, series that Sanjay has envisioned and uh, applied himself to implement. Uh, and a privilege to have all the people who've been attending these sessions and enriching it with their questions and answers. And the framework, Sabine, that you put forward for us uh, you you began with this this very wonderful demarcation of you know things that we take for granted about the conventional methods, the participatory methods with your graphics and the effort <coughs> to put in the text and the visuals uh, very very coherently, and then this very nice thing that you mentioned about which is also reflected in Indian philosophy about being detached about your work about keeping your biases aside. I think that was a good take from the way to approach the process of documentation. Uh, you talked about the assessments, whether it was the assessments of the significance or assessments of other aspects of decision-making or the interaction between the artist and the interviewer. Uh, this uh, interesting take, which a lot of uh, our, our visitors and our um, visitors as in people who visited the site, uh, our participants at, uh, uh, found um, uh, um, uh, um, attachment to was this aspect about replication for a better understanding of the materials and the artworks. You mentioned about the social role of the artwork. And I think this gives, uh, uh, this sort of connects the process of conservation to curation and exhibition and all these other aspects also. Uh, what was interesting was the discussion that came forth from how much is acceptable, how much is not, whether to the owner or the artist or the conservator or a journalist or the public for that matter. Many mm -hmm. times the public prefers a more sensational uh, view of the mummy skull showing through rather than a conserved way, everything is okay, right? So yeah. in that sense. Also, uh, there were very interesting points that both Sanjay and you discussed. Uh, for example, was the the question of how would the artist be the author of something depending on how much has been conserved, how mm -hmm. much has been intervened now, whether it is the polychromy or it is the structural uh, stabilization of the object. Uh, and you went to other areas like um, reconstructions and the call that the stakeholders have to take and the various questions that people put forth. So I think it was a very good opportunity to get 
uh, not only the process of you and your growth that brought you into the profession and th this was eventually uh, your PhD work which eventually got published. And we thank you so much for sharing it with us uh, and for the little care you took of what to show and what not to show because they were personal uh, diaries. Uh, we thank you for your uh, attention to detail and uh, uh, magnanimity in sharing the entire process with us. And I'm sure many of us here will take this and uh, take you as one of the mentors, you and Sanjay, and take things forward in the world of conservation. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Sabine, from my side. Thank you. It was a real privilege for me as well. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, uh, Sabine, uh, this video will be uh, on Facebook for a while, and then we'll transfer it to YouTube. I hope that's all right with you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Sabine. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I leave. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Good night. Night. Good night. Thank you.